On today's show, Jeremy Grant joins Damian Lillard in Portland. Was it a mistake? And what are the Pistons going to do with all that cap space? Plus, the NBA draft is tonight on Thursday. Who's moving up? Who's moving down? We'll talk about all that on today's Locked On NBA. Let's go. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome. You are locked on to the NBA. My name is Nick Engstead, host of the Locked On Mavericks podcast. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Remember, Locked On NBA is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. But the best way you can help the network grow is to comment below. Comment below what your team is and who you want them to draft. Let us know. If it's Mavs, be like, get a pick. <laughs> if it's Magic, who do you want at number one, etc. Joining me. As always on a Thursday, just kidding, first time, Richard Stamen from Locked on NBA Big Board, a.k.a. Mavs Draft on Twitter. Richard, what you got for me? Hey, it's Christmas for me. This is the right? day we unwrap all the presents, get to <laughs> see where everybody lands, all these prospects we've been studying, some of us for years now, uh, depending on how long they've been in college or how long people have been watching in high school. Finally the day. When did you start in this class? Like, when did you start working on this class? The first prospect I watched from the that is in this class now, yeah, 2019. Uh, and there's a kid, he's such an obscure prospect now. Uh, well, actually, uh, yeah, Paul Scruggs, it was the 2018 19 season. Mm. Uh, he's from Xavier, Taurus ACL, not going to be drafted. Uh, but beyond him, it's been some juniors, there's been some kids from high school where I was watching them back in AAU, kind of just a name, didn't really think of much of, and now they're here. It all builds on itself, and it builds up to tonight. But the trades also build tonight, and they start hopefully start coming in fast and furious. But according to Adrian Wojnarowski, Jeremy Grant is going to the Portland Trailblazers for a 2025 first-round pick that comes from the Pistons via the Bucks. So not a very good pick, probably in 2025. Even uh, my first initial reaction to this trade was that's all they got for Jeremy Grant. It just seemed like. They could have gotten more for him. Pistons fans, I know. I talked to Kuka Hill from Locked On Pistons about it, and he had been just bemoaning about how much Pistons fans were thinking they were going to get for Jeremy Grant, but they don't get anything that helps them right now at this point. Well, yes and no. They don't get an immediate player. They get an open roster spot and save a ton of cap space. True. And now they have the cap space to get somebody if they really want. Uh, Nick, close your ears. Jalen Brunson, <laughs> uh, potentially... <laughs> A guy who was in the same draft also as Jalen Brunson, DeAndre Aiden, maybe Miles Bridges if they think Charlotte is you know not going to match anything. Colin Sexton, they could get a combo of some of those players. They really opened up the roster spot. And on top of that, I think the pick swap, that 36 for 46 is also big because that 30s range is almost as likely as to get a hit of a player as the 20s are. Yeah, true. So that that's the side of it for the Pistons is – Clear up all this space. Jeremy Grant did want to go. And I saw a lot of people saying, Well, how did you how did the you know the Mavericks get Christian Wood for just that 26th pick? How did the the Blazers get just Jeremy Grant for that, you know, that 20, 25 first? Like, how did they get those guys for these low picks? And it's like, find the disgruntled player. Find the guys that don't want to be in their position anymore. And then these teams are motivated to trade off of them. But for the Pistons side of it, it's you know, yeah, you, you clear up that space. You can go after DeAndre Ayton. You can go after Jalen Brunson. And that's sort of the, the whole thing for them. We'll talk about some of the teams they're linked to in a second. But let's talk about the, the Blazers side of it. Uh, what does this mean for the Blazers? Do the Blazers, they get better in this trade. But sometimes I feel like we t talk about Jeremy Grant like he's a pseudo all-star. Like he's not even, near, he's not near that level at, at this point in his career. Like we saw him have some, some good moments in with the Pistons. But didn't really even lead that team to a certain point. He's kind of this guy that was this overqualified role player with the Nuggets, and there was all this you know hype about him, just like, oh, what could he turn into as this overqualified role player? And then he became a starter and was like the pseudo star on the Pistons, and then it was just like, oh, this is too much. It's like it's too big of a role for him. What do we think he's going to be in, in Portland? Yeah, he was kind of an empty stats guy at the end of his time, really actually most of his time. In well, how do you, how do you really feel about him? <laughs> Well, I mean, like, he was. He took almost yeah. as many shots as points he had in a game. Like, that's a quality uh, measure of empty stats. And also, he was on a bad team. That combination's lethal. But for Portland's perspective, 
you know, we, I feel like it feels like it's been a lot longer than it actually has been since Jeremy Grant was in Denver, where he was at, I think that was the best year of his career was that final year in Denver mm. where he was playing just such a great role, doing just enough offensively, great on defense. And I think you're going to see him return to that form. And for Portland, somebody like Damian Lillard, I mean, that whole team, they need defense. I'm very excited about it. And on top of that, now you know he can, can create his own offense, control the offense at times. Do they really have that before and forwards uh, as much as they do now? And I mean, they're linked to other players too that could help that as well. Yeah, the rumor from Chris Haynes that Portland now wants to try to get OG and Anobi for the seventh pick. Uh, a lot of Pistons fans thought that you know this the, the Blazers Pistons Jeremy Grant thing had been go- rumor had been going on for a while. A lot of Pistons fans thought they were going to get that seventh pick, and now this seventh pick going potentially to the Raptors for OG and Anobi. I reached out to Sean Woodley, locked on Raptors, and I was like, what do you think about this? And he basically sent me an eye roll in a text. Like, if he, if he could read words and like hear an eye roll, at a certain point, it would be that. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's just, you know, the. I think it is Portland trying to show Dane that they're trying, right? Which, this is the whole thing. And that's why I asked the beginning if this is a mistake, is because... Dame says he wants to stay there, and so they just have to keep... The Blazers just have to keep trying. Is it the best, like, team building for their team? Are they going to go anywhere with with... With you know Jeremy Grant and now Damian Lillard and they got rid of CJ McCollum and Anthony Simons restricted and what happens with him and like are they going anywhere with that team? Probably not. But you keep building around Damian Lillard because he wants to stay there. Yeah, and who knows with the Western Conference right now too? I mean, you never know with injuries. We saw this year nobody saw the Mavs making a Western Conference Finals outside of the most optimistic Mavs fans. <laughs> who knows? I mean, and the Blazers have done it once; they could do it again. And with the current roster that they've got, I, I really think the OG stuff is real. I think the Raptors are willing to move him uh, personally, but I think seven's a good return. Is it enough? Who knows? It's hard to say after the the last two trades we've seen. Let's speculate wildly, though. What what if it does happen? What if they do get OG for the seventh pick? Then all of a sudden, I kind of I kind of like these moves. Then it's it's like the, this. They needed to do two things and not just one for me to try to like this pick. Cause then all of a sudden you get two wings that can play together. That'll play good defense. It'll cover up for Lillard and Anthony Simons. You wish they still had CJ McCollum, but the only reason they could get Jeremy Grant was because of the CJ McCollum trade. They got that trade exception for CJ McCollum and then turned around and turned that into Jeremy Grant. So it's like, if you want to aggregate that whole trade and make it CJ McCollum for like the stuff they got plus Jeremy Grant, you can, if you want to, but what would you think about a Blazers team with Jeremy Grant, OG and an you know, a winged team. It's finally, they have two good wings, like the first time since Nick Batum. Like, is that the last time they had good wings? Yeah, when he and Wesley Matthews well, him and Wesley, were there. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a long time ago. Lamarcus well, Aldridge <laughs> was the best player on that team. Like, that, that says a lot. I, I really do like it if they can pull it off. Uh, for me, it just got, stems down to current OG and Yanobi would probably be a top three player in this draft, if knowing what you know. I think you mm, went up true. the ladder and said, yep. how high would you take OG in this draft? I, you could see an argument for three or four, maybe even higher, depending on how low you are on Paolo, Jabari, or Chet, or Ivy, any of those guys. There's a very real argument. So if you're giving up number seven, I think you're getting better value. And really, punting one year of the draft a current year doesn't screw you over long term in any way. I think that's very helpful. And on top of that, the 2025 pick, it's the Milwaukee pick, odds are that's in the 20 to 30 range. Did you really lose much to get two immediate helpful players without really giving up a dangerous long-term asset? No. And I think if that's the case, if this does happen, Portland has come away incredibly victorious before free agency even starts. Yeah, it's a little bit of a risk because Jeremy Grant is expired. He's gonna is it on an expiring deal? This is the last year of his deal. So there's a little bit there, but hey, you roll the dice with that, right? Like you said, they're not giving up a ton. It's not even their pick, right? It's not even like what if they're bad and oh, their pick is gonna be in the it's not even theirs. It's, it's Milwaukee's pick. So, yeah. Uh, for the Pistons side of it, we talked about their cap space. They, they have forty-three million dollars in cap space with the ability to open up fifty-five million dollars in cap space. They've been linked to a bunch of different guys. DeAndre Ayton is the number one guy. Jalen Brunson they've been linked to, like you said. Uh, Miles Bridges is another one that they've been linked to. And the Hornets are like talking about packaging one of their picks with Gordon Hayward to try and get off of his contract so they can keep Miles Bridges because uh, the guy on your shirt, Jumpman, doesn't want to pony up <laughs> pony up the money for, <laughs> for for keeping Gordon Hayward and for get, keeping Miles Bridges. Uh, who do you think Detroit goes after, and which one do you think is most likely? 
Well, I think one of the players that will be thrown in with Charlotte potentially might be the person on this jersey, which is James Book Knight. <laughs> so we'll see. But I, I think the number one target for sure is DeAndre Aiden. I think yeah. it makes too much sense. I know for a fact this is the team they had number one on their board. They was Chet Holmgren. This is a team that was sour when they lost big in the lottery. They were the biggest losers on lottery night. So I think they're really hunting for a center. And because of that, they're going to pay for a center. And I really think in addition to the names you threw out there, I feel like they're going to get somebody next to Cade Cunningham, like Colin Sexton, that can just score and score at will. He's somebody who's forgotten because he tore his meniscus, but I think uh, I think he's somebody who could be in the mix as well. I don't think Jalen Brunson is going. Miles Bridges could come home to Michigan. Ultimately, I think Charlotte matches that, though. The other name that I think Jake Fisher of the of Bleach Report mentioned was Mitchell Robinson is another name they could go after, which is if, hey, if they – if they if they don't get DeAndre Ayton and Jalen Brunson, then you get Colin Sexton and Mitchell Robinson, which are like the, the little downgrade of that. But that's still good gets for the Pistons. And all of a sudden you have a, a nice little core that you can start building around. And uh, it's interesting for the Pistons. Their future is pretty interesting, especially what they do with number five and see if they decide to make another a move with that or if they just take a player. But coming up, let's talk about a couple other rumors around the NBA. And then we got to get into the draft because we got... Mr. Draft himself, Mavs Draft on Twitter, Richard Stamen. So we'll talk about all that and more coming up. Before we do, let me tell you about oh, NBA Jam. NBA Jam is back. And Arcade One Up, the leader in in-home retro gaming, has an has has these machines that you can get in your house. Did you ever go to an arcade and think, man, it would just be cool if I could have one of those? the big stand-up console things that stand up in your house to play NBA Jam. You can just walk by, play NBA Jam, whatever you want. But then you're like, probably, I've seen those in celebrities' houses. Like, I saw Shea Serrano even get one for his office one time, and I was like, dang, like, dude, that, that dude's doing really well if he can get one of those in his office. I just saw that one time, and I was like, man. But RK one up has has these for you starting at just $400. You can get Golden Tee, Mortal Kombat, and a bunch of others, even NBA Jam, starting at $400. So go check those out. They're not going to cost you thousands of dollars. Arcade, the number one up.com. They'll get, you'll get the NBA Jam Shack Edition at uh, an estimated early September ship date if you go for it right now. But you can enter to win a free NBA Jam Shack Edition console right now. Uh, arcade, one up.com slash locked on. That's arcade, the number one up.com slash locked on. Go check it out. Get NBA Jam. Enter to win a free one. Arcade, the number one up.com slash locked on. All right, Richard, the picks in the Ultimate Mock Draft have been made. Go check out the Ultimate Mock Draft wherever you listen to podcasts. It's also written up in places, a bunch of techno sites like 11 Alive Atlanta and other places. So go check out the Ultimate Mock Draft. You were on there a bunch of times giving all your analysis on some of these picks. Uh, I made a trade for the Mavericks that ended up not being worth anything because the Mavs made, the Mavs made a trade themselves. Uh, but go check out the Ultimate Mock Draft. All right, let's talk about some of these other rumors quickly. John Collins is going to get traded probably it just seems like from everything that's being said Woj said that if, if he had to bet anybody to get traded on draft night it'd be John Collins and the rumor that's coming up right now that I just find hilarious is John Collins for San Antonio Spurs DeJounte Murray DeJounte Murray responded to these <laughs> these rumors from Bleacher Report um, first of all he tweeted four eye emojis just out of nowhere and you're like gotta love that around this time of year when a player does that and then Bleacher Report tweeted out from the Jake Fisher report that the Hawks and Spurs had talked about a John Collins for DeJounte Murray swap. And DeJounte Murray quote tweeted it, said, uh-oh, with like a bunch of H's. And then a popcorn, like a popcorn box, like emoji. Uh, first of all, incredible move by DeJounte Murray, but what were your thoughts on this, on this potential deal and, and Murray's response to it? Yeah, Murray's response is a 10 out of 10. Uh, <laughs> I don't like the deal. Really, for I, I kind of like it for the Hawks. I think uh, I personally think Dejounte Murray is the better player right now. Um, it's not a knock on John Collins; just Dejounte is really good. He's in, he grew to be like a triple double threat on offense. Yeah, efficient, grew as a shooter and also as a spectacular defender. Was an all rookie guy as a deep, or excuse me, all defense guy as a rookie, and he's only grown in that regard. I personally think San Antonio is just kind of. I think they're bluffing. I don't think they would do that. I don't. I think Atlanta is desperate to trade him, and they would love to get something like that. But I don't think that's the move. I, I just I can't see that. 
Yeah, I, I don't see that either for them. Yeah, I think that if, if it was just that swap and there was nothing else in it, the, the Hawks are getting an incredible deal, an incredible guy to fit next to Trey Young. You could pull off a bunch of other stuff like like on the court, what Steph, like what Steph Curry does, where he could just run Trey Young off the ball and have, have DeJounte Murray handle the ball. And obviously he covers up for him on defense a lot. It would be an incredible move for them. Uh, for the Spurs, I don't really get it. Like, are you just betting on Keldon Johnson to all of a sudden take this step up? Are you... Like, what are you betting on at that point? Is, is it Lonnie Walker you think is going to take a huge step forward? Is it Devin Vassell? Like, I don't know what you're doing at that point. You should build around DeJounte Murray. Now, Murray's extension in 2024, maybe they're balking at that and saying, I don't know if we really want to go for that. But John Collins has already signed his extension, and it was pretty much a max. So you're paying a ton for that guy, and I don't know if he elevates your team as much as what DeJounte Murray did. So, yeah, I think this rumor is not necessarily – like it doesn't have a ton of legs. DeJounte Murray obviously doesn't think it has a bunch of legs, but it's an interesting one. And John Collins is going to move somewhere, but we don't know who it is. It seems like all the different candidates are starting to fall and, and make other deals elsewhere. The Mavs were one of them and then a, a bunch of others. But uh, let's get into the draft. You have been covering this draft for a long time on Lockdown NBA Big Board. You do some great stuff over there. Mavs draft, uh, your site, you have your big board you put up today. Let's just start at the top of the draft. At this point in in draft coverage, which is like the last day, right? <laughs> Some people, most people are listening to this on a Thursday, the day of the draft. Where does the draft start today? Yeah, you mean I'm assuming not like the coverage on on TV. No, where right? does you it? Where does the draft start? So like we know, I think we know that Jabari Smith's going one, <laughs> probably Chet Holmgren two, p- probably Paolo three. Like where does it start? Yeah, four. Uh, the Sacramento pick. Nobody knows what's going to happen there. Sacramento. Probably doesn't keep the pick if Jaden Ivey, if the consensus top three, the any order of Chet, Powell, Jabari goes top three. What happens there? Sacramento is the first domino. I, I see it as a first, like three dominoes are going to determine the entire draft. First one is Sacramento. It was weird that they jumped to four. It's probably the first time in NBA history uh, where, <laughs> or at least like in the, the last like three years, that a team has gotten in a worse situation by getting a better situation at hand. <laughs> uh, the only thing that comes close is like when the Mavs in 2018, they won the coin flip to get better odds into the 2018 draft, only to lose a couple spots and have to trade a pick to get Luka Doncic. So they're like a kid. The they're first- like a kid at the prom that like has a limo already lined up, and then it's just like it just means that more people can say no to them, right? Like it just gives them the, op- the ability to get turned down more. Yeah, it's because everybody knows they don't like. And that's not true. They might take Jaden Ivey, but like, let's just walk through the steps of that. They just traded Tyrese Halliburton yeah. because they were like, well, we like our two guards we have. And they traded him for Demonis Sabonis. They have holes. Uh, they just paid De'Aaron Fox, like what, last year? Technically, I think last year was the first year of his yeah, new right. extension. How are you just going to go, all right, now that we're done with Halliburton, let's get another guard to throw into this mix. Unless you really want to move off Davion Mitchell, which – I wouldn't put it past them and no, like no disrespect to the Kings, but like also have you seen the moves they've made? Like <laughs> anything could happen. So they're the first domino and then it's really the number seven pick. And from there, New Orleans could shake things up. I think they're very the Usman Jang sweepstakes. It's going to be him or Dyson Daniels. Mm. And that's where my first rift in my board starts. Uh, Usman Jang is the guy that I made. The, we made the pick uh, 21 in our ultimate mock draft. I felt really Feeling really good about that pick at this point in draft coverage. Um, why is he rising up so far in big boards? Seems like he's the big riser right now. Uh, it was Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. Now it seems like it's Ujman Jang. What is he showing people or what are people accepting about him that is making him rise so far? Yeah, he's he's a guy who, yeah, it is definitely a uh, competition between the two. He's somebody who in his first year at um, – in the uh, NBL this year, he was in France before he was young. He's, I think he's still like brand new 19. He's very young. The issue with him is the first 11 games. He was horrible. Four points per game, two rebounds per game on 25% shooting. And if you really want to just pile this on 15% from three, four total free throws in 11 games after that. So kind of just splitting the season in half. I just added one game, 12 games stretch. He averaged 13.3 points per game. 48% 48% shooting, 35% from three, and took 23 free throws. So you look at that combination, and it's like, which one do I believe? And he's been killing workouts. I know he had one, um, I, I can't say which team, but it was a team very much in this newfound range in the top 10 
that he did a great job for. And that's why I think he's starting to rise. Mm. Uh, teams are believing our own Rafael Barlow, the, the main dog at locked on NBA big board. <laughs> he, he was talking to me about like on one of our episodes about, you know, he had a huge barrier at the worst time. He had to learn a new language in a new country at 18 years old in the peak of the pandemic. Like that Oof. was the absolute peak. Oof. He was on lockdown a lot. Australia had it really, really, um, just completely strict on him. It was tough. And then things eased up with COVID and suddenly his game started getting better and better. As New Zealand was even stricter. Weren't they, they were even stricter than yeah, Australia too. Correct. So yeah, correct. And he's traveling between both. It's interesting to see him rise up. I think he's just such a fun, interesting guy. Like you could, you, I could see in like, I don't know what, like three or four years. He's the best player in this draft. Could you? Yeah, I, I had him preseason top 10. I thought the talent was just too much. He's 6'9", 6'10", can create his own shot a little bit, can pass, very good defender. I, I don't – something I've seen is a lot of people on draft Twitter, they don't like his defense. I'm personally a huge fan. I watch him one-on-one. -on -one. He can shut down anybody. Um, so I, I really believe in his game just being an all-around wing. And When you're an all-around wing in the NBA at 6'9", 6'10", you're probably a star. Give me some uh give me some sleepers. Who's a couple guys later in the draft, maybe in the first round, that you're like, ooh, this is a guy that I think could be really good and people are sleeping on him. Yeah. Some I heard this best said uh, by like Michael, Michael Scotto, I think was who said it. Draft players who are just gonna stick in the league for a while, because look at how it goes. The draft goes like the top 20 players are just players who played like eight to ten years in the draft, like minimum you are automatically a top 20 player from doing that. Like 2016, for example, Dorian Finney-Smith is the top 20 player. Wasn't even drafted, no. but has already established himself six years. He is head and shoulders safely a top 20 player because of that. Not even talking about his actual play. So Jake Laravia from Wake Forest, mm. he really comes to mind. He's somebody who everybody who has talked to him just raves about how much he loves the game. He's a student of the game. He knows everything about every prospect in this class, works on his game. He's a junior who... It's an interesting story. People thought he was 22 yeah. <laughs> and he's actually 20 and like a half. So he's young, <laughs> does a little bit of everything on the floor too. He's not the greatest athlete, but he's also not a bad athlete. That's his pretty much glaring weakness. Uh, my guy with that, with the way that you said, like, just pick a guy that's going to stick is Wendell Moore. Like you just, you read all the stuff about his, his game and you're like, oh, that's a guy that I could see the Grizzlies probably take. And he just sticks in the NBA for a really long time because he can just do every little thing that you want an NBA player to do. Yeah, and, and it's funny with him. This is only his second draft eligible year, despite him being a junior. So he's young. He's mm. not even 21. He won't turn 21 until training camp. He can shoot really well. That was his biggest weakness as an underclassman was he was scared to shoot. He still is growing in confidence of shooting over defenders, but the role he played, he did a little bit of everything, mostly an off-ball player, could be trusted with the ball. Not really much of a self-creator, but could create for others. And just all in a minimal role and was so good at it. That's why that was a big part of why Duke thrived. Yeah, his where he goes is going to be really interesting. Fit, I think, is going to matter, but he kind of fits into anywhere. Uh, all right, coming up, let's play our favorite game we play every single week here on Thursday, Locked on NBA. We'll play Count It Up, where we count out the most interesting, fun things around the draft, the NBA. Kyrie Irving and LeBron James are talking. Uh, PJ Tucker going to, the, going to the Sixers and leaving Miami. Brad Beal wants to be DC's Dirk. We'll talk about all that and some more draft stuff coming up. All right, Richard Stamen, let's play our favorite game that we play every single week here in Locked On NBA on a Thursday. Count it up, count it up, count it up, count it. Where we count out the most interesting, fun things in the NBA. The first one, let's do a couple draft ones. We just talked about Wendell Moore a little bit. And he's sort of the swing guy here, but how many first rounders do you think Duke gets? I think they get four. Um, I think the, the odd man out is going to be Trevor Keels. I think AJ Griffin is going to go first round. Uh, I think Mark Williams is going to go first round and obviously Paolo is going to go first round. However, you know, you kind of look at like uh, the G League Ignite last year. Their big thing was how many first rounders did they get? Isaiah Todd was the 31st pick. It wouldn't shock me if Ooh. Trevor Keels is the 31st pick. Uh, when, hopefully, Wendell Moore goes a little bit higher than that. Uh, Keels is like all over the place on some of these uh, boards and mocks. We just talked about him on Lockdown Mavs. Um, you had him at 34 on your, your latest big board. The Ringer had him at 39. ESPN in an old mock had him at 26 to the Mavs. 
That was the highest I saw him. The Athletic had him at 31. Raphael had Trevor Keels on his latest big board um, at 57. Now that, that is an <laughs> interesting spot for Trevor Keels. I found that I found that really fascinating how low he had him on him. Not not high on Trevor Keels at all. But yeah, he's he's the guy. If Wendell Moore is a first round pick, then Keels he can maybe sneak into that 30th pick. But it'd be tough for me to see that. Um, yeah, and Wendell. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Wendell Moore is somebody who I actually think he might. It wouldn't shock me if he's flirting with a lottery. I mean, I could see him going 14th to Cleveland. He fits like a glove there. Mm. The players in the draft, the oldest players in the draft the last couple of years. I looked this up because you, you put this out as like one of our counted up questions is who's the oldest player to go in the draft. I started looking it up and I went by basketball reference. So I think they count like what your age is on, in like January of the of your rookie season. There's been a 24 year old. Every single year, I went all the way back to 2010. I had to stop because I was like, I'm spending way too much time on this rabbit hole to try and go down and see how many. But like last year, Chris Duarte, 24. The year before that, Sam Merrill, 24. The year before that, Cody Martin, 24. 2018, George King, 25. Um, 2017, Kadeem Allen. 2016, Malcolm Brogdon was 24. And um, and Buddy Heald. A couple other notable ones. Uh, Gorgie Jang in 2013 was 24. Uh, 2012, the oldest guy in the draft. <laughs> Played in Dallas his rookie year. Bernard James was 27 years old. Was 27 years old in the draft. That's the oldest one I found. But Count it up. who's the oldest player in the 2022 draft that gets drafted? Is there going to be a 24 year old? Because we have we've had one every single year going all the way back to 2010 and probably before that. Well, first let me just say Sarge is a Dallas legend uh, at 27. <laughs> uh, don't let's not talk about who he was picked in Tw- front of. 27 but. years old, not the 27th pick, by the way. 27 <laughs> years old. He was picked right in front of Draymond Green, if I'm not mistaken. Oh. So at least they got the veteran leadership. But I think <laughs> there's one candidate that really sticks out to me, and that is Quentin Jackson from Texas A&M. I, mm. I'm looking at his age. He's 23.8 by my math. That's training camp. He turns 24. He is somebody who I got to see him in Portsmouth. I know he made a good impression, really athletic, great shot, can play make a little bit, needs to be a better, more consistent decision maker with the ball in his hands. But you look at those tools and given his size at around six, five, six, four and a half, he's a little bit skinny, but he can explode. I think somebody might take a chance on him in one of the last picks. And, you know, a lot of those guys you named are some of the last picks. That's where teams just say, you know what? I liked him here. I know he impressed in Portsmouth in April. Maybe it's stuck, stuck with some teams. There's a rumor going around right now that the Mavs are trying to trade back into, trying to get back into the 30s at some point. Uh, you pointed this out. One of your sources said that the Mavs are trying to get back into that draft. So count it up. Count it up. Where do you think the Mavs pick? What's the number? Yeah, I think the exact number. Uh, I, I've been thinking about this all day. And <laughs> I, I've gone back through like seven different answers. I'm going to say they in a in a way to squash the rivalry i think they take the 43rd pick from the la clippers oh interesting interesting because just the clippers what are they going to do with that pick like they got (laughs) bj boston that was their obligatory you know end of roster gamble pick they don't need that another year so they just give up that pick they don't need that the roster spot maybe they're trying to do something for Kyrie. like (laughs) there's all kinds of uh and for the mavericks i think they hope i think they're hoping that one of their guys drops uh like i'm looking at tankathon right now they have christian coloco in the 43rd spot like that'd be amazing for the mavs like that's right what the mavs want to do uh ishmael kamagate is a center that i know that they've has worked out for the mavs would be really interesting for them uh they could take a a a a swing on prashida the guy from from italy um at that spot and stash him there's some interesting the, the Jalen Williams from Arkansas. I'm seeing kind of go late there. That's a guy that I would love to see them take a swing on at that point. So it'd be really interesting to see what the Mavs do. Uh, Bradley Beal turned down his player option, and a bunch of people talked about it. But he's just going to re up for the max, whatever he gets the the five year two hundred and or the, the five year was it like four hundred and something like the amount of money that a, a country's GDP is in a given year. Uh, but Bradley Beal came out and had a quote recently that said he offered up this quote that he wants to be Washington, D.C.'s Dirk, like the, the Dirk Nowitzki of Washington, D.C. So, count it up. Despite how many, <laughs> despite saying this from Bradley Beal, count it up. How many more fake Bradley Beal trades will people make in the next calendar year, even though Bradley Beal wants to be D.C.'s Dirk? <laughs> um, give or take, I'd say 3,907. <laughs> 
All right, let's carry the one. However, how many media outlets there are, including Locked On Podcast. Okay, there's at least 34 of us. And so <laughs> this is just going to keep happening. People are just going to keep throwing Bradley Beal in trades. It doesn't matter how much he says he wants to go back to D.C. He wants to stay in D.C. his whole career. He's satisfied there. He doesn't want to leave. People will just keep throwing him in trades, and it just will never end, I don't think. Yeah, he's he's kind of in purgatory. Like, this is what happens when you're... But he's fine a, with it. And yeah, like the Wizards are in purgatory themselves. Like he's in a small market for the NBA standard on a team that hasn't won a ton. They peaked at the conference semifinals, I think. I don't think they made the conference finals, right? No, they haven't. I don't think in a yeah. while. And, you know, it's it's hard. Like it's people want... Got. People want their people want stars to win, which I get. But do they do they do the stars want to win necessarily? Um, Mark Stein is uh, reporting that PJ Tucker is expected to leave Miami and potentially go to the Sixers. The Sixers are the the team that is the most likely to get PJ Tucker. Even even as I even asked David Ramil about this, and he uh, said Sixers are probably the team. But count it up. How much more money would you need to make to live in Philly over Miami? As a person, <laughs> I'm gonna need a couple extra million. <laughs> uh, I think I think this is like PJ Tucker's got to be nearing his retirement tour. The dude has been in the NBA since like Greg Oden uh, was drafted, <laughs> and like it, it sounds ridiculous, but that's 15 years ago. And when you're a 15 year vet, you're like Man. one of what? There's probably I mean I I don't know this off the top of my head. I'd say five players like Rudy Gay comes to mind, LeBron, Melo. Who am I missing? And still starting at Chris Paul. Yeah, yeah, Chris Paul. But like still starting for a good team too. Yeah, I I don't know if he starts in Philly though. I think this might be when he finally gets moved to the bench. Which is fine. I think it's I think at some point during the year they'll they'll start him because they'll be like, oh, we need more defense and for <laughs> all sure. that kind of stuff. Uh all right. Mikael Bridges was was asked a question about how the Phoenix Suns fans I'm, I'm gonna do this. Sorry, Phoenix Suns fans. Actually, I'm not sorry. But our Phoenix Suns fans were furious, so upset about their loss to the Mavericks in Game 7. And he was asked about how mad Phoenix Suns fans were, basically. And Mikhail Bridges responded, I mean, I'd be pissed too. I was pissed. That is that is how it is. If you really care about a team and you have high expectations, you're supposed to be frustrated. Especially after that type of L from Mikhail Bridges. So, count it up. <laughs> Count it up. How long will it take Phoenix Suns and their fans to recover from that loss to the Dallas Mavericks? Suns in four months. <laughs> I think it'll take longer than four months, especially if they have to move stuff around to keep DeAndre Ayton. There's talks about like they're gauging interest in Jay Crowder. They've talked. There's been rumors about Cam Johnson having to leave. Like if that happens and they have they keep this team. And Sarver doesn't want to pay it because they lost in the second round of the Mavericks. That would it would take a while for them to overcome this, especially like I've seen some fan Suns fans on like Suns Reddit and stuff say like, "Oh, well, our title window is closed. That's it. It's done." Like, like, oh my gosh, it could take a while for them to get over that. Yeah, that's true. I uh, I just I think I think they're going to make some big splashes. Uh, kind of a side tangent. It wouldn't shock me if they traded like somebody that we don't expect to ever get moved this off season by them into the draft tomorrow. Like if they moved like Cam Johnson and for like a first round pick, it wouldn't shock me. Like if somebody like Jeremy Sohan or someone falls, right. Somebody mm -hmm. who I think universally, almost every team likes. Um, I personally have my own concerns, but if someone like him fell to like 19 and he's there. Like, I think they might just say, all right, see you Cam Johnson. And <laughs> like, I, I mean, you saw what happened. I mean, we all, we both saw it. We're Mavs people, but like, you know, we saw what happened, how Cam Johnson was getting cooked he was. by Luka Doncic. I don't think Jeremy Sohan would, like, right now, I don't think, I think he could hold his own. Mm. Last one here. There's tons of reports all over the place about Kyrie Irving. Just so many different things being said, being mentioned, being mentioned that has been mentioned. One of the ones that stuck out to me was from Mark Stein. Quote, there are credible rumblings in circulation that Kyrie Irving, for starters, has indeed had some recent contact with Los Angeles Lakers star LeBron James, his former Cleveland teammate, to presumably discuss a potential reunion in Hollywood. I'm told that would be a stretch, though, to suggest that the Lakers are currently pursuing Irving. So, count it up. On a scale of one to ten, how much is this just a play? And what do you, what do you, how many words do you think LeBron and Kyrie Irving's text conversation was that, that end up being this rumor? <laughs> I'm gonna say nine out of ten. Uh, <laughs> how many 
something. How many times can Wash King be said? I'm trying to multiply <laughs> this by two. Wash uh, King. I'm going to say I'm, 34 I'm there words. for you. Be awesome to play with you again. Like, yeah, <laughs> dude, it would. Oh, Kyrie Irving and LeBron James talked about a reunion. I think, I think that's what this is. I think that's all this is, is that they talked about it and said maybe they like met up somewhere, they like ran into each other in some LA thing. And then all of a sudden they're like, man, dude, it was so great when we played. Remember that time I hit that shot in Cleveland? Like, yeah, man, that was so awesome. Be so cool to play with you. Yeah, you're always a little brother to me all the time. Hashtag Wash King. Like he says that in his his everyday life, LeBron does. And uh, I think all this stuff, all this stuff about Kyrie Irving, I think, is just one big play to get the Nets to say, oh, man, we better pony up because somebody else is going to come out and try to get Kyrie. We better just keep him because we're either going to make KD mad or – and KD's probably sitting at home like, I'd be mad. Like, I would be mad if this happened. <laughs> All of it's a play. All of it's a ploy for Kyrie. I, but watch him get traded. That'd be that'd be crazy chaos. I'm hoping for chaos. Go follow Richard Stamen at Mavs Draft on Twitter. NBA Big Board will have all kinds of stuff. He'll be on a bunch of our clips that we're putting out on all kinds of YouTube channels, breaking down all the prospects. So go check out your favorite Locked On NBA's uh, channel and on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. Guys, thanks so much for listening to Locked On NBA. Boom.